What is up, everybody? Happy, happy hour. Welcome into this all new episode or happy hour pack a day podcast edition, whatever the heck you want to call it. Thanks so much for being here. Super excited for a what should be a really fun conversation. Obviously, we had a literal ton that happened this week from a Packers standpoint and around the NFL. It feels like forever ago uh, on Monday where uh, you had complete and utter chaos. Sunday, Devondre Campbell gets released. That feels like forever ago. And then, of course, you've got these random things that trickle in the course of the week. A.J. Dillon is back. Didn't see that coming. Uh, Devondre Campbell today signs with the San Francisco 49ers and posts an interesting Instagram uh, photo. But uh, nonetheless, like I said, should be a ton of fun to kind of go through everything today. Um, obviously, this is per usual happy hour. We'll kind of go through the same thing we usually do. Uh, try to get through as many questions as possible. I've got about 45-ish minutes today. Uh, then I do have to take my kiddo to soccer again. So uh, we'll be leaving right around then. Uh, but we'll try to get to as many questions as I can. Uh, Super Chats, per usual, will go to the top. But uh, we'll hopefully get through uh, a ton of them today. All right, so let's actually start with our first Super Chat. And Shane, thank you so much for doing that. Uh, regarding Jacobs and Dylan, is this a deliberate attempt to be bigger in the backfield like the Cowboys game, just running hard at their smallest linebackers? I don't think so. I think these are decisions independent of one another. And I still think there's going to be some interesting decisions that are made, um, you know, with how they want to fill out the remainder of this running back roster. I think Josh Jacobs decision came down to, yeah, I think being bigger and more physical is a piece of that. I think they probably believe that somebody like Josh Jacobs can handle the rigors of the NFL, not just at the size that he is, but at being 26 years old rather than, you know, bearing down on the age of 30. I think that's definitely a piece of it, but I think what really brought Josh Jacobs to green Bay isn't necessarily just his size or just his strength or his physicality. I think it's the fact that green Bay believes he can be that 2022 version of Josh Jacobs who was phenomenal. And if Green Bay gets that, even if he was, you know, two pounds or sorry, uh, two inches, you know, smaller, or 20 pounds lighter, I think they're still happy to have that running back. But I'm sure that plays a piece of it. With AJ Dillon, I think this ultimately came down to this was probably just too good of a deal for Green Bay to refuse. And it gives them options going into training camp, depending to, you know, dependent upon how much he has guaranteed in that deal. And it's not much more than a million if, at, if they max out the guarantee or it could be as little as nothing. It could very well just be a training camp tryout for AJ Dillon and really nothing more. Meaning that if you get through training camp and he's one of the best three running backs on the team, then you gladly bring him back. And this is going to be something where Dylan probably knows he has to earn his spot. And we hopefully see the best version of AJ Dillon because 2021 AJ Dillon was pretty freaking good. Over a thousand all purpose yards. Uh, I think it was what eight touchdowns somewhere in that range and like good efficiency. He was really good that season. If you get that AJ Dillon at, you know, what would basically cost them a little over a million for a one-year deal on no downside, that's awesome. And if you don't, if he, if that AJ Dillon doesn't show up, if we see the AJ Dillon that really could not get anything going, was averaging around three yards per carry, he might not make it out of training camp, but that's okay. Like you're giving yourself options. So I think that was just the decision there. You have Emmanuel Wilson, who has some size and speed on him as well. So right now, yeah, they do have a bigger, you know, running back room overall. But my guess is they're still going to address that via the draft. And they're probably going to want a different flavor of running back. Maybe someone a little bit more, um, you know, speedy, shifty, dynamic in the backfield that can do some things. But if they have a trio of running backs who have good size and good athletic ability and can make plays, I don't really necessarily care what the size, speed, strength ratio is. So I don't necessarily think that this was deliberate uh, in, in totality, but there is a deliberateness to wanting big, physical, fast running backs. And if you can do that, then by all means, go out and do it. All right, Nancy, thank you so much for becoming a all new pack a day podcast member. For those of you who've not checked it out yet, make sure to do so. Tons of great stuff. We had a ton of people sign up this week, which is beyond amazing. Nancy being the newest. So Nancy, appreciate that a ton. All right, Kevin, how much influence do you think Rich Passaccia has on bringing Jacobs from Vegas since he was there in 19 and uh, 20 and 21 and Fuller or Blackman two years, 11 to 12 million similar contract like Curl got? First of all, the bad news, Kevin, and looks like you did post this way earlier today at about 1.21 p.m., so you probably know this by now, but Jordan Fuller did sign with the Carolina Panthers, was a one-year, I think up to $6 million deal, something like that. Cameron Curl, as you mentioned, also off the market as of right now, unless something happened in the last five minutes. Julian Blackman is still out there. He would be a great addition to the defense if Green Bay wanted to go in that direction. As far as the first question, 
I don't think it hurts. I definitely don't think it hurts uh, that, you know, he had a relationship with Rich, Rich Basaccia. What also doesn't hurt is, is giving him the most cash of any running back um, in free agency. That's why he's a member of the Green Bay Packers. I don't think he specifically went out of his way to be like, man, got to get back with Rich Basaccia, who is the special teams coach in Green Bay. It doesn't hurt. And the, the big thing for Green Bay is I'm sure they got great intel from Rich Basaccia on what Josh Jacobs can bring to the table. So there's some mutual, um, there's just a mutual benefit to, again, Jacobs probably having some familiarity with somebody in Green Bay and Green Bay having familiarity with somebody who has worked with Jacobs in the past and can probably give hopefully a glowing review. So that's all great. But the reason he's in Green Bay is because he got probably the biggest contract uh, that he was going to get anywhere on the market. He has the ability to be the guy in Green Bay, which was probably beneficial to him. And then there's the other bonus things where he said getting to play with Jordan Love and a winning team and Rich Basaccia. All those are little things that help. And maybe, maybe there's a world in which the Green Bay Packers and the Minnesota Vikings or some other team enter whatever team you want to enter offer Josh Jacobs the exact same contract. And then the difference maker is a Rich Basaccia or is a Jordan Love in that situation because Green Bay actually has a quarterback right now. Those things could be the differentiator, but the biggest one is probably that that dollar sign and then the lot of zeros that came after it. All right, Ron, uh, can you briefly revisit your Green Bay position rankings? I think off-ball linebacker replace safety is the worst position on the roster. Yeah, I know before, I, for members only, we did a video that ranked the position groups uh, off the top of my head, you know, what what would be the the worst position group on the roster right now? I think, oddly, um, we might need to talk about offensive line a little bit in that conversation. Not necessarily just due to the starters, although Josh Myers and Sean Ryan still give me some concern, and Rasheed Walker is still a ascending, growing player. The depth is what I would have a lot of concern there. And that's one of those positions where, if you don't have the depth, if you don't have the players that need to come in and play, like everything crumbles because love will be worse. Jacobs will be worse. The receivers will be worse. The tight ends will be worse. The offense is worse, which makes the defense worse. worse. Like it just all kind of crumbles underneath it. So offensive line is something that Green Bay is going to have to take a hard look at. There's not much left in free agency. This is probably going to be a position that they have to sort of um, solidify via the draft. And I would expect them to do so in a very significant way. I still think first round offensive line is probably the, the position that might be staring them in the face the most, but either way, if it's not a first, second, third, fourth, like I would expect three or even four offensive linemen taken in this draft to give them a little bit more depth and competition at that spot. Safety still has to be in the conversation. Xavier McKinney, phenomenal, huge, huge pickup, uh, should be a pro bowl caliber player at that spot. But after that, Anthony Johnson Jr., uh, Benny Sapp, Zane Anderson, you're not left with a whole lot after that. So that's a position that still needs some upgrades. Off-ball linebacker, yeah, it's great that they got Christian Welch back as the back of the roster special teams guy, but this is still a, a linebacker group that's basically just Quay Walker and Isaiah McDuffie. So there's definitely still work to do, uh, even though Green Bay has, has done a, a lot of really good things so far this past week. They have work to, to, to do yet. The great news is, They've got a lot of time until that first game. They have 11 draft picks. They've got five picks in the top 100. They have the ability still to go out and spend money if they want to. There's still some free agents out there. Spoiler alert, that's going to be tomorrow's episode is which free agents out there still make sense for Green Bay. So we'll go over that. But uh, Green Bay has some options to fill those spots, but they definitely are still out there. And yes, Kevin uh, Fuller. Oh, there you go. Uh, he is off the market. Very shedding a tear on this Friday. Uh, because I, I thought he just would have been that perfect fit next to, uh, you know, Xavier McKinney, and they would have been a really fun one-two punch. Might be just a little bit too much to spend at that safety position, and they might just want to go a little bit cheaper there, specifically attacking it via the draft, which I don't think is the worst thing in the world, but uh, Fuller would have been really, really fun. All right, uh, Richard, would you explain the difference between a Mike linebacker and a Will linebacker? What are their roles and what is the ideal prototype? Uh, Green Bay will need to add to that room. This might be better for a bigger breakdown, um, Richard, in, in the coming weeks when I have the opportunity to do so. Um, it, it just really depends on the defense. It depends on what you know style of play that you want from those linebackers within Green Bay's defense. We haven't really seen Jeff Halfley's uh, linebackers and how he wants them deployed. Um, the way that I kind of view it in general is just like a very simplified breakdown in like a 4-3 defense. You have your strong side, your middle, and your weak side. 
your strong side is going to be on the strong side of the opposing team's offensive line. So if they've got, you know, five offensive linemen and a tight end, the tight end side is going to be the strong side. So the strong side linebacker is going to be there. Think of it this way. If you're running to that side of the field, the first line of defense after the defensive line is the strong side linebacker. He needs to be bigger, more physical at the point of attack so he can take on those blocks and sort of crash everything and make it so that there's not this big gaping hole. So you usually want somebody a little bit more physical playing the strong side. Uh, the middle linebacker is going to have a variety of responsibilities. Obviously, their ability to flow to the football is going to be huge. You usually want those defensive tackles to keep your middle linebacker clean so they can go and make those plays. But a middle linebacker also usually has to be the person who's in control of the defense, green dot on the back of the helmet, being able to drop back in coverage and cover the middle of the field. You usually want them a little bit taller because I think if you're going to do any cover two or if that linebacker is responsible for the middle of the field, uh, you just want a taller player with bigger wingspan because there's going to be that gap behind you and you want somebody that's just going to look like a monster out there. Uh, Brian Erlacher was obviously such a great player in that regard, but again, somebody can flow to the football, get off of blocks, drop in coverage, really kind of do a little bit of everything. And then your weak side linebacker is again, going to be on the weak side and then they're going to be able to flow to the football a little bit more. You want somebody usually a little bit faster, a little bit quicker. They're going to have some coverage responsibilities, but imagine they have to flow to that strong side of the football. And if your strong side linebacker, your middle linebacker, defensive linemen are taking on blocks, a lot of time it might be your weak side linebacker that's going to be the one that's left free and able to flow to the football. Think of your Lance Briggs next to a Brian Urlacher. Like Briggs was the perfect weak side linebacker next to him. So those are again, a very basic responsibility. We don't have the time. There's a million times more nuance to that, of course, uh, that we're not going into in full detail today, but, um, that's sort of the, the different way. And the way that you look at it is you have your two outside linebackers, strong and weak side, and then your inside linebacker or middle linebacker is called that. Cause he's literally in the middle of those three linebackers. So again, lots to go over there, but that's probably a, a decent small breakdown of it in a, a couple minute uh, breakdown here. Uh, Showtime, would you be concerned if the two starting linebackers are Quay and Edrin Cooper? Great athletes, but aren't the most sure cover in tackling linebackers? Like anything, uh, Showtime, there's going to be advantages and disadvantages to everything. And it's uh, my my faith right now, until I'm proven otherwise, is going to be in Jeff Halfley, that he's going to be able to get the most out of the players and utilize them in a way where they can be successful. What you have to do is take those strengths and figure out a way. All right, we have Quay Walker and Edrin Cooper who are young, still learning the position, even though Quay will be going into year three and a little bit inconsistent, but they are fast. They are physical. They are strong. They can get sideline to sideline. So Jeff Halfley's job is then to figure out how can I put a defense together where they have to maybe think a little bit less and they can fly to the football a little bit more and I can utilize them sideline to sideline and really make it so that it's really difficult for offenses to get anything going because we have all this incredible speed on the field. And that's going to be up to Jeff Halfley in that situation. Now you might have a different situation where you've got a Levante David and, you know, a couple of really veteran linebackers that maybe don't have the speed anymore than an Edrin Cooper and a Quay Walker have. That's up to their defensive coordinator, figure out, all right, we've got these really smart linebackers that know and have seen everything, but they just don't have the foot quickness anymore. How can we put them in a position to be successful, even though they might not be able to get sideline to sideline anymore, or might not be as physical anymore. Those are the things that there's always going to be advantages. There's always going to be disadvantages. But in that situation, Green Bay's advantages are that they have two young freak athlete linebackers. Now it's up to Jeff Halfley to put them in a position to be successful and minimize the weaknesses that they would have with maybe not having the experience and consistency as some of those other uh, linebackers would. That's better. Um, all right. Uh, would Blackman be a fit in the box with McKinney deep? Absolutely. The thing about Blackman and McKinney in that situation is they would be very versatile. Now you're going to probably spend 80% of the time with McKinney in the post in, in single high situations uh, with uh, McKinney in the post and with uh, Blackman in the box, if that were to be the case. But the great thing is McKinney could play in the post and uh, sorry, Blackman could play in the post and McKinney could play in the box and you would be totally fine. Like they can both do that. And we went into the off season, at least I did thinking, Hey, if Julian Blackman has to be your free agent safety edition, uh, you still feel better about it than you did with any of the players that were on the roster last year. It still would have been an upgrade. Now they've got the, you know, alpha in Xavier McKinney and he can do a variety of everything. And now you have this perfect compliment in Julian Blackman who can also do both things and they can utilize them in a variety of different ways and maybe make things uh, confusing for opposing offenses. So no, I absolutely believe that Blackman would be a great fit next to Xavier McKinney. 
yeah, Jerome Baker, uh, to be totally transparent, Douglas, I haven't gone and actually watched a ton of Jerome Baker tape after he was released. Um, I will probably do that before my episode tomorrow talking about uh, free agent options for Green Bay. I do have him on my list. I just put my list together, but I didn't have the opportunity to go through and watch some of them yet. But I, he's clearly, in my opinion, the best linebacker left on the market. I think he's, uh, if I remember correctly, just a little bit more on the undersized side. I probably would have liked somebody a little bit more physical, maybe next to Quay. But to me, again, there's no question he's the best linebacker left on the market. And the big thing here is Anthony Campanelli. He was his linebackers coach in Miami. And we talked earlier about Rich Passaccia. Does that help get Josh Jacobs to Green Bay or whatever? Maybe it may, you know, helps Green Bay get a, a Baker. But the big thing is we don't know what Campanelli's review of, of Jerome Baker is. Campanelli might say, stay away from that guy. Or he might say, yeah, go get him. Uh, but we just don't know what that review is. But I think what we have to be confident in is that we have no better person maybe in the world to give that scouting report on Jerome Baker than the Packers' new uh, linebackers coach in uh, Anthony Campanelli. Uh, does happy hour imply that we're all drinking? Because I am drinking. I've got a uh, brisk iced tea here. Um, trying to wreck my uh, acid reflux as much as I possibly can before I actually get the surgery done. So I'm enjoying a uh, brisk iced tea right now. But I hope you guys are enjoying a uh, adult beverage if you are uh, of age. Uh, what position does my kid play? I play center back on my high school team. Uh, my son plays uh, just about everything. His primary positions are center mid, and uh, he, he'll play a number nine as well. Uh, but he plays defense. He can play some goalie. He's amazing, uh, better than I ever was at soccer. And uh, it's really, really fun to watch him play. So he's got an advanced training tonight, trying to make him even better. Uh, but he is a very, very fun player to watch and uh, definitely a joy to do so. I get to coach him too, which is really, really fun. So he's he's a stud. Uh, how are the pack going to address the linebacker situation? Big gap there yet. At this point, your, your guess is probably via the draft primarily. Uh, we did see from uh, Bill Huber that it sounds like there is some interest maybe in Denzel Perryman. Not sure how much that moves the needle to, for me, to be honest. As I mentioned, you do have Jerome Baker out there. You've got uh, Isaiah Simmons still out there, but there's not a ton. But uh, maybe a, a, a slight veteran and then probably going to have to be via the draft. I'm assuming Isaiah McDuffie as well as Quay Walker are going to have pretty significant roles in the defense. Obviously, Quay will. But right now, it's it's slim pickings out there and not sure that there's going to be any major addition that they're going to make that changes that all too much unless they go very aggressively in the first couple rounds of the draft. Not sure, honestly. This is what we talked about with Devondre, where there was just a weird vibe all last year. It just it was time to move on. Clearly, Green Bay was going to go in a different direction. At least it felt that way. Nothing is shocking anymore after Green Bay releases Aaron Jones and brings back A.J. Dillon. You never quite know what's going to happen, but it felt like releasing Devondre was a foregone conclusion. They did. He's in San Francisco. Devondre's sort of always been this way of just kind of using things for a chip on his shoulder and um, maybe not always quite being satisfied. Like, that's just sort of what's made him tick. That's fine. Uh, good luck to him in San Francisco. And that's kind of all I have to say about it. Uh, Ten Head Gin from Wisconsin and Tonic. There you go. What is going on with Newman? Uh, I'm assuming uh, you're just asking like about his status in general because I haven't seen anything else about Royce Newman come through. Uh, but he's on like a one-year, $3 million-ish deal. Rams are signing Jimmy Garoppolo. Interesting decision there. But uh, anyway, uh, Royce Newman, uh, he's like on a one-year, $3 million deal. Um, and one of the things I asked when I talked to Justice Mosqueda the other day is these guards got paid, paid, like ridiculous. Like we're seeing ridiculously high deals. So he's on one year, $3.2 million deal right now because he hit his incentives. Now, the thing with Newman is if they release him, they save all but 125,000 of that, basically 124,836. So my assumption going into the off season is very clearly they're going to cut him and save 3.1 million. It's what I would do, but uh, the guard market has been absurd. And it might just be that they, until they find other depth, meaning until they get some players in the draft or via free agency and feel comfortable releasing him, they may not want to do it quite yet. The same $3.1 million they would save right now is the same $3.1 million if they get to the end of training camp and realize they don't want to stick with them. So there's really not any downside right now. They don't need the money. They have plenty of money to go out and spend if they want to. They have plenty of money to get Jordan Love's contract done. Money's not an issue. 
So they don't, and they don't need the roster spot. So they don't need the roster spot. They don't need the money and they have no depth on the offensive line. So just releasing him now is probably not maybe the smartest thing to do. Even if we, I think probably all think, do you really want that guy in your roster? But right now, let him go to camp, let him compete. If he's one of the best depth guards and hopefully that's not the case, but if so, you probably just keep him. If not, you release him, you save the money later and hopefully they get enough players via the draft or the remainder of free agency that they can go out and um, not have to pay him that contract the remainder of the season. Three or four, at least Andres, unless they do something crazy in free agency. I, my guess is you probably want, so you've got your five ish starters right now. You've got Royce Newman, Luke Tenuta, Caleb Jones. And then I think you probably want, so that's eight. I think you probably want at least four more. Uh, and now that could be like an undrafted guy. We'll see what they think of like a Kadeem Telfort from last year. I think you probably want at least those eight and like three or four draft picks at minimum. And then maybe like a smaller free agent signing. Maybe you bring back a Yash Nyman. Maybe you try to find a, you know an offensive lineman on the cheap in the market like they've done in the past. But I think you probably want at least 12, 13, 14 guys competing for those, those, you know, nine to 10 spots on the 53 and they need to get younger. They need more competition. I think three or four offensive linemen in the draft, sincerely. Uh, the line will be much better. So I expect AJ better. I don't know that I expect the line to be that much better. Um, not from a run blocking standpoint. I don't know where that would come from, to be honest. Rashid is trending in the right direction and maybe he takes a step and maybe he becomes a slightly better run blocker. He's not a road grader. He's not going to move a ton of people. Elton Jenkins, solid run blocker. Josh Myers, eh, not great as a run blocker. Sean Ryan, I do think if you give him that spot, I do think that can be his strength. I don't think he's going to be great in pass pro, but I do think he can be better in run blocking than what, what we saw last year uh, out of you know John Runyon Jr. I did think Sean Ryan was a slight upgrade in that way, but I don't know if it's significant enough. And then Zach Tom, phenomenal player, but again, he's not a mover. So I, I don't know. I don't necessarily see just all of a sudden them developing this great run blocking group, unless they make a, a pretty big addition in the draft that is going to change that in a significant way. But that's a lot to ask of maybe just one draft pick too. So I think they'll be fine and they might even be slightly better, but I don't think it's going to be much better. I would probably push back on that a little bit, baby QB. Vero, cheers to you as well. Hey, Josh Jacobs. Thanks so much for being here. Uh, how do you feel about Halfley hiring so many college coaches for his staff? No issue whatsoever. Uh, they have a very energetic staff. Also, you have to remember a lot of the the college coaches that he hired were like the assistant coaches. Um, Anthony Campanelli obviously is um, somebody that has a lot of experience. Their defensive uh, passing game coordinator, whose name is, uh, what is it? Derek Ansley. There we go. Derek Ansley uh, is has a lot of experience, and they obviously keep Ryan Downard. They keep uh, Rebrovich. So they have plenty of experience on that defensive staff. Uh, so going and getting some of those guys and adding them as assistants, no issue whatsoever. Plus the fact that they know Halfley's defense and what he wants to accomplish. So you kind of get the best of both worlds. You kind of have these veteran coaches that know what they're doing and are going to be able to buy into Halfley's system. But you also have some of these assistants that know it already and can probably help some of the veteran coaches transition into this new system. I think it's a really good blend overall. Uh, thoughts on Woodson saying on a podcast, he was prepared to retire before playing a snap in green Bay after signing the contract. I showtime. I'd have to, I'd have to hear it. So, cause this makes these two different things here. He was prepared to retire before playing a snap in green Bay after signing the contract. Um, that's an interesting one. I haven't heard that. I'd have to go back and listen to that to, to comment on that further. I'm not sure what that means. Thanos feel sorry about that. Uh, thanks for all the content. Love watching your videos. Kenny, thanks so much for that. Really appreciate it. Uh, hey, we don't have to choose either. Like Aaron's amazing too. As soon as you're done with this, if you, hopefully people are in Aaron's are finishing up Aaron's and then coming back and watching this one. And once this one's done, go and watch Aaron's. Um, you know, Aaron and I have talked about, we have to figure out a better time slot. So we're not on at the exact same time, but respect the hell out of Aaron. He kills it every single week. And uh, like I said, if you're in this one, as soon as we're done, go and listen to Aaron's right after this one. How does Aaron Jones not know anyone on our roster? Is he, uh, I don't know what this is in regards to. I'd have to, again, know what the, the context was there. With so many off-ball linebackers off the board, where do you think Green Bay spends in the value market of free agency and other safety, O-line depth, or other? Um, where do we, in the uh, value market? Yeah, I have an episode coming on this tomorrow, and we'll go over some options. I got 12 people on my list right now that I think would still make sense for Green Bay. So cheap plug, look out for that tomorrow. 
was very impressed with the interviews of McKinney and Jacobs for McKinney to say multiple teams and he chose the Packers as a ton. Yes, but remember, it probably was just that Green Bay had the most money to spend or gave him the most money. That'd be my guess. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm cynical. But usually dollars and cents do the talking with which team you ultimately choose. Jen, thank you so much. Happy Friday to you as well. Hope you are doing well. And Xavier, thank you so much for doing that. Uh, is it crazy that we're barely talking about David Bakhtiari this week with all the news? It is. It, 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 like, I'll be totally honest. None of nothing got, I guess, I think Aaron Jones, um, the release and him moving to Minnesota got enough attention. And I think Josh Jacobs primarily got enough attention as well. I don't think Xavier McKinney got enough attention as he should in most situations. And in most cycles, that would have been a, a signing that dominated like an entire week of conversation. I think the big thing with Bakhtiari and not getting enough attention on that is because he, that was like, like that was the most expected thing that happened. We really did not see Aaron Jones coming. We really didn't see Josh Jacobs coming. You know, Xavier McKinney was our pie in the sky sort of guy, but definitely didn't like have expectations that he was going to sign in Green Bay. So that was all unpredictable. The most predictable thing that happened this week was David Bakhtiari getting released. And I'm not saying it was like 100% a certainty, but that was the most predictable thing. I think that's probably why it got talked about the least. I did mention this with Perry and Alex earlier this week. Don't want to make a thing out of it. I don't think Green Bay did anything awful or you know, anything crazy and don't want to cause drama where there doesn't need to be drama. I just, if it were up to me, I wish Bakhtiari could have been released last Friday um, just because I think he deserved sort of his own day and his own goodbye. And there was, there was no way they weren't going to release him on Monday. They knew it on Friday already. There was nothing that Green Bay gained or lost by doing it uh, you know, a day earlier. Um, and I'm not saying, I don't think it should have been like a Friday news dump either, but if they could have done it a, a couple of days early and give it Bakhtiari's own day and, and the ability to sort of say goodbye and, and, you know, let us talk about that for a little bit before we got to the chaos of this week, I think that would have been kind of a better gesture. Well, I guess I don't think Green Bay did anything wrong or um, anything like that, but that would have been, a, I think, a slightly better way to do it. Uh, Baltimore interviews this week were cool. Can you tell how much you love or... All interviews this week were cool. Can you tell how much you love Green Bay, how he talks? Um, I don't know why I'm blanking on Ball, but like I was thinking Baltimore interviews, but all right. So Xavier McKinney, uh, Josh Jacobs. I don't know what, like, I don't know. Sorry that I'm missing the the context here, baby QB. Uh, Xavier, I heard the Cowgirls and Colts. We don't need to do that, but Cowboys and Colts had interest in AJ Dillon amongst the other teams. Do you think he took less money because he wanted to come back to Green Bay? I think there's probably a mix. I think the market probably wasn't as strong as he was hoping for. I think the deal was probably close enough that um, he probably took a little bit less to come back to Green Bay, but I don't think he probably got a major offer. I think if he would have got a major offer elsewhere, he probably would have just gone. But remember, his family's in Green Bay. Um, and, you know, he obviously mayor of Door County. That all plays a, a factor into that as well. So I'm sure there was probably a little bit of both that the market maybe wasn't quite as strong as he was hoping it would be. And then Green Bay having that option to use the, the four-year qualifying offer, get him more money, cost less against Green Bay. It probably just made sense for both sides, but I also don't think the, the market was overall all that strong. Uh, we should take Jonathan Brooks, let him side, uh, sit behind Dylan while he recovers from the ACL when healthy, he jumps Dylan. Don't mind that idea at all, Andres. Could get one of the best running backs, if not the best running back in the draft, um, not have to rush him back from the ACL. You could still take somebody else in the meantime, but if you have to go into this season with Jacobs, Dylan, and Wilson, not the worst thing in the world. And then next year, you've got potentially Jacobs, Wilson, and uh, maybe the best running back from this draft and Jonathan Brooks. Uh, Mike, I did see some of the, the rumors on that. All I'll say this is, in I'll, I'll believe that they're signing a player over the age of 30 when they sign a player over the age of 30. Um, they've been primarily looking at, you know, 27 and under sort of players for a, a bit now. Now, could they get after the the draft and maybe the some of the positions weren't, you know, acquired the way that they were hoping for? Then maybe they could go and look at a Tashawn Gibson or a Micah Hyde at safety or a Denzel Perryman at linebacker, or maybe one of these older players at that point. But my guess is they probably still want to try to fill the roster out as much as possible with some of these younger guys. Uh, not yet, Sam. Um, like I mentioned, I have my surgery next week. My hope is that I can just sit in bed for about two weeks watch a little March Madness and watch a ton of draft prospects. That is my hope. Um, so I've obviously watched a decent amount of draft stuff already, but we'll get, we'll narrow down that list in a very significant way as we get closer and closer to the draft. Yeah. Uh, Bill Huber mentioned that uh, he has an article out that 
Perryman might have some interest in the Packers. The Packers might have some interest in him. So definitely a name that's on the board right now. Given the signings of various safeties today, do you think that makes it more likely that a college safety like uh, the Minnesota Nupin uh, would become uh, Packers first round pick rather than a lineman? Uh, I'd safety, I don't know that he'd be a first round pick, but I definitely think safety will be very much in those top five, 100 picks. I think first round safety is probably a bit aggressive when you've already spent uh, a big amount of money on Xavier McKinney. Although we do know they signed Amos and drafted Savage in the same year. But my guess is you're probably looking at, uh, and it's, I think it's Newbin, by the way, but uh, you're probably looking at um, probably looking at second, third round for, for that safety would be my guess. I know we'll get the best player on the board, but uh, would you go O-line depth or corner depth? Uh, best player available, but I think offensive linemen, there's a really strong chance. I think those are probably your two best bets in the first round, though. If I were betting money on offensive line and corner or uh, the field, uh, definitely give me offensive line or corner in round one. Uh, what's my drink of choice? Usually it's a old fashioned. Um, I love rogue dead guy ale. That's one of my favorite beers. Uh, what else do we drink? Um, I really love the, uh, pistachio cream ale, which is from a brewery in Milwaukee. That's definitely one of my favorites. Yeah. Summer shandy in the summer. Can't go wrong. Uh, lining Kugel's Oktoberfest in fall. Can't go wrong. But yeah. Old fashioned. There's a, my favorite drink, uh, in the world is a pecan old fashioned from play bistro in green Bay. They're play their, uh, pecan old fashioned. It's to die for. Absolutely love that. Procrastination is evil. Thank you so much for becoming a, a new member. I'm just going to check the, uh, did I get all the um, super chats here? Thanosville, uh, impro offline, draft free agents, improve the offensive line, draft free agents. Hello from Puerto Rico. Um, I, I, I think what you're saying is improve the offensive line via the draft and free agency, which if that's the case, I am right there with you, uh, Thanosville. And thank you so much. And hello from uh, Wisconsin to you in Puerto Rico. Jacob, wild hearing the new guys talk about 10's influence on them landing in Green Bay. Watching Jacobs, has he been used in past uh, game outside of screens? Yeah, not. You're, this is not a player that you are going to line up like a uh, Christian McCaffrey and like have him try to beat corners one on one. That's not his primary objective. But screen game checkdowns and there's definitely routes that he can run. He can run a, a Texas route and those sort of things that you can get him involved in the passing game. But there's always a difference between the person that you can line up in the backfield, motion out, have him go on the slot, and then teams be legitimately concerned that even if you have a good corner on him, he could still beat you. That's not Jacobs, but he definitely has a lot of use in the passing game as well. Vex, good to see you, bud. Is Quay going to play like a top 20 pick this year? Um, here's what I'll say about that. I'm really excited to see him in Jeff Halfley's defense. I'm hoping that this is the year that things click. I do think we saw progress in year two. I think it was what anyone was hoping for, meaning I think everyone was hoping the jump would be a little bit bigger, but definitely, definitely, definitely felt like we saw progress and that he continues to trend in the right direction. But this sort of needs to be the year he takes a significant jump and hopefully he does that in Jeff Halfley's defense. Uh, any thoughts on Jerome Baker? Yeah, we talked about that a little bit earlier. Definitely the best linebacker on the market. Definitely would be somebody I'm interested in. Definitely would be something that I think uh, with Anthony, Anthony Campanelli being his linebackers coach in Miami, now being in Green Bay in that same position, I definitely think that that would be a very good fit. So yeah, I'm I'm all for that. Aiden, do you think Cooper DeGene drops to 25? It's definitely within the realm of possibility. I, I don't think it's uh, I don't think it's far fetched to say that he could get to 25. I don't think it's far fetched to say that if Green Bay really wanted him, that you know they could move up a few spots to maybe 21, 22 if they really wanted to get him. You know, I think that's possible as well. So within the realm of possibility, yes. And could Green Bay go up a, a handful of spots to get him to? Possible. But my guess is they probably stay where they're at. If he's there, he'll be in the conversation. If not, um, you know, Goody, they'll go best player available dependent upon what position is there. Uh, still think I'm too down on Dylan. As Nags put it, AJ is a phenomenal player that coach just fails to utilize properly. He's an awesome running back too to have on a winning team. Nags and I agree on a lot of stuff. I disagree with that. I do not think he's a phenomenal player. I don't know if, I don't know if actually Aaron said this. I definitely do not believe that Green Bay has utilized him uh, improperly in any way. Uh, but I do think he was really, really good in 2021. I do think he has his uses. For those that are thinking I'm just dragging AJ Dillon and like think he can't be a useful NFL player, that's not what I feel. For those of you who followed me long enough, I like playmakers at my playmaking positions. Jocker. I, I like players that can score touchdowns from anywhere on the field as, as many positions as possible. 
running back, wide receiver, tight end. I want those guys to be able to get the ball in their hands and make big plays. And AJ Dillon is basically allergic to making big plays. I think he had nine runs over 10 yards last year, something in that range, eight to nine. Uh, that's my biggest thing. Can he be a good pass protector? Yeah. Can he catch the ball of the backfield? Yeah. Can you use him, uh, you know, as a in between the tackle running back? Yeah. Um, kid was 2021 AJ Dillon really good. Yeah. Like the, the, he's a usable NFL back. I, I don't think there's anything. Um, I don't think he's not, I'm not, I'm not, definitely not saying that he's not, I think different people have different flavors of players that they like. And AJ Dillon is not my specific cup of tea, because like I said, I like somebody who can get the ball in their hands and make big time plays. I am a bigger believer that AJ Dillon is primarily going to get what is blocked for him. My also big thing that I talk about with running backs all the time is when you get to the second level, if the offensive line blocks up everything perfectly and you get one-on-one -on -one with a safety or one-on-one -on -one with a linebacker in the open field, what PlayStation button are you going to be able to push to beat that guy? Are you going to hit the X to hit the stiff arm? Are you going to hit the um, you know circle to do the spin move? Are you going to use the joystick to juke him out? Are you going to use the joystick to truck stick him? Like what do you, are you just going to use the turbo to run right past him? AJ Dillon doesn't have any of that. In theory, it's the truck stick, right? You want him to be able to run over that safety, run over that linebacker and run right through them. In practice, what happens is AJ Dillon tries to run through them and they both just go down. And there's no beating that guy. That's where my issue lies more with AJ Dillon is it's a lot what's blocked for him. There's not a superpower in the open field that he has at his disposal that he can go to to get past that second line of defense, even if things are blocked up perfectly. And there's not enough big time explosive plays to pay off the usage rate that he's had within the offense. But can he be a usable NFL player? Is he a 53 man rosterable player? Yeah. And if you can get him at a vet minimum, is there, is there any real downside here? No. So there's, there's a mix there, but I, I disagree. I disagree that, uh, I, you know, that I'm too down on him and I disagree that I think he's a phenomenal player. And I definitely disagree that I think, I don't think there's any way that Matt LaFleur has utilized him in any wrong way. Yeah. Sam, Mike, Will. Yep. There you go. Uh, seems apparent that O-line and linebacker are going to be top draft picks. Those are definitely going to be two of their priorities. Uh, why does Goody hate linebackers? I don't think he hates linebackers. It's just, th there's a, there's a way that you have to go about building a roster and there's only, there's a finite amount of resources that you have. I will say, I think Goody has adjusted poorly. Um, because I do think line, like off ball linebacker plays become really, really important in the NFL. And this has been a position that the Packers going back to Ted Thompson and um, even sort of Ron Wolf, they haven't prioritized quite as much, but I think there is a need for a sort of readjustment to go back to this position and say, Hey, we really need this to be a, a big time position in the defense. I'm sure he would love great off ball linebackers and I'm sure, you know, he's not allergic to that, but he's going to usually spend what he wants on more premium positions. And as of thus far, he hasn't really done that. Now he did spend a first round pick on Quay Walker just a couple of years ago. That's not nothing. I think the big thing is they just need Quay Walker to live up to those expectations and be that big time linebacker. And if so, then we probably have a lot less concerns or a lot fewer concerns about him, you know, prioritizing off ball linebacker because that first round pick would have panned out in that situation. And Lucas is echoing my statements right there. Uh, would trading for Snead from the Chiefs make any sense for the Packers if they'd take like a current uh, third or fourth for him? Would that be a good move? The biggest answer to this is there's no way it happens. My second response is it's probably too much to pay because you're going to pay him a massive deal and it's probably going to take at least a second round pick. And then the other issue here is you're, you're log jammed at the outside corner. You then have Snead and Jair and Valentine and Stokes on the outside. You have Valentine on the outside, and you still only have one guy really in Keyshawn Nixon that can play inside. So you're sort of in this situation where it probably just doesn't make a ton of sense. He's a phenomenal player, but you have to give him a massive contract, which Green Bay probably doesn't really have at their disposal with some of the contracts coming up and giving Xavier McKinney a huge deal. So no, it, it, it's not going to happen, and it probably isn't the right move at this point in time, but he's a phenomenal player. If the Bears draft Caleb Williams to get either a Dunze neighbors or Thomas Jr. And then Sam Darnold plays average QB play. Do you think the North would be considered the best division in football? Listen, Lions and Packers should both be very good. If Caleb Williams is as advertised, which I think he will be, the Bears have the ability to make a jump pretty quick. The Vikings, the Sam Darnold thing, I still expect them to be fourth with Darnold and just some of the things that they have to do, but they have made some really interesting moves and they are going to probably go up and get a quarterback too. 
But yeah, I think I definitely, definitely think that this could be a very competitive division dependent upon what happens at quarterback for the Bears and the Vikings and how quickly those young quarterbacks can sort of develop in those systems or what happens with Sam Darnold. But Green Bay, Detroit should both be very good and easily competing for playoff spots. And then it's going to be up to Minnesota and Chicago to bring up the bottom end of that division or just remain bottom feeders too. That'd be fine. But uh, we'll see what they do, especially at those two quarterback spots. <laughs> Packers draft going to hit. Yeah, it's going to be really, really fun. I can't wait for it. All right. Uh, it feels like this team still needs a lot of depth. Do you think we come out of this draft with more than 11 picks, especially after spending big on a low number of free agents instead of getting cheaper? Listen, here's the thing. I, I don't necessarily want to see them take a lot of those top five 100 picks and move them down for worse picks. I want to see them utilize them and get as many good players as they can because numbers are great, but I mean, they have a pretty, like they can go out and fill a roster right now if they need to. They need to get good depth, right? They need another offensive lineman that can legitimately go in and start. They need a linebacker who could theoretically start. They need a safety who can theoretically start. You'd love some competition at that slot corner position. Um, you'd love a really good backup running back that if Josh Jacobs went down, they could theoretically go in and start. I'd rather have really good depth than just, you know, 17 draft picks that the majority of them were fifth, sixth, seventh rounders. So I listen, there'll, there'll probably be a lot of maneuverability from Goody, but I think there's a, a value in having those top five, 100 picks. And that's where I really want to see them come out of this draft with some really uh, improved depth at a variety of different positions. I know he doesn't actually hate linebackers more making a joke about him not signing after Campbell. Gotcha. Gut tells me the Packers take offensive linemen first round. That's where I am as well. Uh, are there any free agent options for H back position or are very likely attacking it via draft? I think more importantly, they're just going to get rid of it and not necessarily get rid of it, but they'll use Tucker craft a little bit as an H back. They'll use Ben Sims a little bit as an H back. Like they'll use some of the guys currently on the roster to fill that spot. I don't think they need to have a specific and like DeGuara would play like 10 meaningless, useless snaps a, a game. Like they'll be fine if they, if they don't replace that. And they have Henry Pearson on the roster as well. If they really wanted to go in that direction as a developmental fullback slash H back. But my guess is Tucker craft, Ben Sims get a good chunk of those all of 11 snaps a game that they need to fill. Definitely don't think they need a 53 man roster spot for that. Uh, the AFC North will still be the best division in football. All four of those teams are playoff caliber uh, to some extent, the bears and uh, so AFC North Ravens, definitely uh, Bengals definitely in that conversation. Um, Steelers will be the interesting one. Steelers, Bengals, Ravens. Who am I forgetting? Steelers, Bengals, Ravens. Oh my goodness. This is the biggest brain fart of my entire life. Uh, Browns. Yeah, obviously. So yeah, they, they will, um, yeah, that's going to be a really good division. No question about it. The Steelers with Russell Wilson is going to be really weird though. They trade Kenny Pickett today. But yeah. That's going to be a tough division to compete with. Take a shot of vodka and eat some marinara sauce. Have that esophagus on fire. See, this is where like, I forget who told the joke. Was it Kevin James? Which I'm not really a huge fan of, but like he told the joke of like, if you're going to the dentist, like really get in there with like Oreos and sardines and everything, like really make them earn their money. I'm going in, you know, esophagus of flame. Uh, if they're going to fix that thing up. No, I was looking at this the other day, super shoe. I don't really see any trade candidates for linebacker off the top of my head, but Hey, if Goody can find one, all the power to him. Thoughts on Rudy Ford. This would be one of those where you get through the draft, you get through free agency or sitting right before the eve of training camp and Rudy Ford's still sitting out there and you look at your safety depth and be like, man, we're kind of a player short and we'd love a, another guy who could play some special teams. And maybe you sign him into a vet minimum deal and have him compete. But outside of that, that's, that's probably the extent of it. Uh, Leighton Vander Esch, I did post this. I did think there probably would be. It does sound like he is probably leaning more towards retirement and his neck injuries are very problematic. So at first glance, I thought that maybe he could just because the linebacker depth is so weak. And if he was back healthy, I thought he could at least be an option. But the neck injury seems like it's going to be too problematic and he might just retire overall. I do believe that Myers could play guard. Uh, in an ideal world, maybe you get a starting center in the draft and then you have Myers and Sean Ryan compete at right guard. I've often said too that maybe Myers needs less of the thinking and the snapping and being able to just go out and actually play without having to do some of the other stuff. Maybe that could actually benefit him. Uh, but yeah, if they did go out and get a, a legitimate starting caliber center in the draft, then yeah, I do think that you could have like a, a Myers compete with Sean Ryan at right guard. Uh, thoughts? No, I don't want any uh, thoughts on Aaron Jones wearing a purple sombrero. I want to nuke it from my mind entirely. Uh, yeah, again, linebacker from Dallas, probably too many neck injuries, unfortunately. 
Jackson Powers, I don't think they're going to have to trade up, by the way. The more that I've seen, the more that I've read, it sounds like he's probably more of a second round guy than what people are thinking. But uh, again, I'll have to you know watch him a little bit more before I comment on that entirely. But if they were able to get him, I did see some of him and I was impressed with what I saw. But if they get someone like that, yeah, great. And uh, then you could have him compete at center. You could move him over. You could move Myers over. There'd be a lot of options there if they did go in that direction. Uh, they absolutely will make a trade into the top five. I think they could either end up at three. If they don't end up at three, it'll either be four or five. And in all likelihood, either JJ McCarthy or Drake May will be the longtime starter, or at least that's their hope, will be the longtime starter in Minnesota. But I would be pretty shocked at this point if either Drake May or JJ McCarthy are not a uh, quarterback for the Minnesota Vikings along with Sam Darnold this upcoming season. All right. Uh, let me just get back to any other super chats I might have missed. All right. Uh, Vitor Calero, which I'm sure I'm pronouncing horribly. I apologize. Love your job. Congrats from Brazil. How worried are you about the depth on the offensive line? I am not worried yet because they will attack it aggressively via the draft. Maybe they bring back Yash and Iman. We'll see. But as of right now, I'm not worried. If they played a game this Sunday, and they went into the game with only Luke Tenuta, Royce Newman, and Caleb Jones as their backups, I'd be extremely worried. So I'm willing to give Goot the benefit of the doubt here. He knows how important offensive line play is. There's no question about it. And he will do everything in his power to make sure that there is enough depth and competition there, especially coming off a year where that competition was really integral to the improvement of that offensive line. He's going to attack that aggressively, no question. But yes, if the game were tomorrow... Very nervous as of right now. Not even really a red flag in my opinion because I know Goody's going to address it aggressively. Uh, record prediction next year, Super Bowl or bust? I don't know. Let's let's wait to see how the the roster fills out right now, but uh, I'll use the Mike McCarthyism. They are nobody's underdog. They should go into every single game uh, with every opportunity to win. Are there any linebackers that are even going to go around one? Um you know, Edrin could easily go. Edrin Cooper could potentially go around. I shouldn't say easily, but there's a world in which he goes maybe end of round one, but it's not a super top of the line off ball linebacker group. So it could be round two. Maybe, maybe he falls to green Bay with that top second round pick. That'd be great too. And at least an option at that spot. But yeah, we're going to have to take a look at that position a little bit closer. I do know that, uh, Edrin Cooper, uh, tested through the roof and his PFF numbers are through the roof. Like it's an interesting blend of productivity and size, speed, weight, but Really excited to go back and watch the tape. All right. Probably got to get out of here pretty quick, guys, in the next couple minutes. Um, yeah, a lot of chats here today. Thank you guys so much. Sorry I wasn't able to get through all of them. That's a lot to, a lot to go through, though. We got 400 people in here. Amazing. Jets making Alan Lazard available via trade. Good luck finding a trade partner for that when you've got other better receivers that are getting released because they can't find trade partners. And by the way, way better wide receivers available on the free agent market. Yeah, McKinney not being fast. Uh, let's talk about that. There's always speed and there's always play speed. And McKinney has great play speed. I think there was also like an injury issue that he had at the combine and he was probably just faster than his timed speed. He is great instincts, phenomenal angles, reads the quarterback incredibly well, and has great fluidity in his hips and change of direction ability. And when you have those things in tandem, it's great if you have a 4-4-40, but if you don't have those things and have a 4-4-40, I will take the, the instincts, the change of direction and taking great angles and reading a quarterback. I will take that over a four, four forty. Darnell Savage was really fast. He, he was, uh, he was also not my cup of tea at safety. I'll put it that way, but, uh, he's in Jacksonville green Bay moved on and they got a player who wasn't as fast as Darnell Savage. I guarantee you, I promise you when you look out on the field, you will think that Xavier McKinney is way faster than Darnell Savage, even though Savage had the far better 40 times and everything like that. McKinney just flat out plays faster. Uh, yes, Murphy, defensive tackle out of Texas. Really, really fun player. Don't think Green Bay is going to be in any position to draft him. If he's there at 25, he would be a very interesting discussion, and Green Bay probably should just do it at that point. Sad how players, number 33, assume the team is evil asking for pay cuts while the agents negotiate deals for max money that just get adjusted or cut. I haven't seen the comments from Aaron Jones, so I don't know what specifically this is in regard to. All I'll say is this is extremely raw still for Aaron Jones. He put everything into being a Green Bay Packer. He clearly wanted to stay a Green Bay Packer, and 
yes, these things are business. As I said very quickly out on Twitter or X, I don't believe that AJ, or sorry, that Aaron Jones is a villain here. I certainly don't believe that Brian Gutekunst is a villain. These things just happen. And we have to get to the point as fans of every single player and every single team, this happens to everyone. Tom Brady, Buccaneer, Brett Favre, Viking, Jet, Aaron Rodgers, Jet, Randall Cobb, Jet, Texan, uh, Jordy Nelson, Raider, Greg Jennings, Viking, Aaron Jones, Viking, um, James Jones, Raider. Who else do we want to talk about? I mean, we can talk Josh Sitton, Chicago Bear. Um, you know, David Bakhtiari, probably going to play for another team as soon as he gets healthy. We can go on and on. Kenny Clark, probably next year. This could be his last year as a Packer. If so, he's going to go play for another team. This is going to happen to everyone. Jordan Love, Jaden Reed, Dontavian Wicks. Um, we, whoever you want. Who's your favorite player on the roster? Spoiler alert. They're going to end up on another team. It's just going to happen. And, you know, but right now it's very raw for Aaron Jones. And I'm sure, I'm sure he's caught up in the, everyone loving him in Minnesota and everyone in Minnesota probably wants him to talk smack about green Bay. And so on. It's like, it's just part of it. I have no lost respect for Aaron Jones. I love Aaron Jones. Um, yeah, no, it just is what it is. I have no, no issues with any of that there. All right. Am I allowed to eat pizza after surgery? Here's the thing, Richard. I have a, like a clear liquid diet for a couple days, then just a liquid diet, then a pureed diet, then like a few weeks of only soft foods. And then eventually down the road, I can work in uh, more complex foods uh, like Little Caesars. So I'm figuring out a way. I'm going to spend the next 48 hours figuring out how I can puree a Little Caesars pizza so we're working on that. We have every we have our best people on it. Tyler Herrick uh, right now is working on different formulas to try to figure out how I can puree a Little Caesars pizza. Uh, if you have uh, you know any spoilers uh, or uh, any ways to get it done, let me know. But it's going to be a, a difficult recovery, unfortunately, from from that side of things. Um, my hope is that by end of next week, I'm going to be back and ready to to go in some capacity, at least doing something. But no, probably no live chats next week. Uh, going to be a little bit before I, I probably am uploading videos the day of. I've got a lot of videos in the work. I already uploaded uh, a you know video for for next week, some audio for next week, and uh, working on some other videos right now. Going to have some great special guests on. Uh, have um, you know appoint I had appointments or you know podcast scheduled over the next couple of days. Uh, we I did one today with Carmen Vitali, but uh, Paul Brettel, Aaron Nagler. Um, Justice Mosqueda. So we got a lot of those coming up. I got a couple other fun ideas lined up. So those will be recorded in advance. And uh, like I said, hopefully by end of next week. Otherwise, I uh, might primarily be daily draft from Ross Uglum or might have some people fill in for me as well as needed, like uh, when I was sick uh, of what a month ago now, a few weeks ago. But I promise you there'll be content there, trying to get as many episodes as I can done just in case. But hopefully by end of next week, I'll be back doing something. Some Things say that you could be back doing things in a few days. Uh, some say it takes a week or two. Some say it takes three weeks. Just probably depends on how my surgery goes, how my body reacts to it. The good news is, is it's not like I have to go and, you know, work in a field or work in a factory or do a bunch of heavy lifting. I get to come down and talk about the Green Bay Packers. So my hope, fingers crossed, is I'm going to be able to do that sooner rather than later um, while pureeing pizzas and trying to keep things down as best as I possibly can. All right, friends. Uh, there we go, Travis. Can you juice it with like a, like a pasta or like a marinara sauce? Mm. We're going to work on this, Travis. We're going to figure something out. You guys are the absolute best. Appreciate you guys a ton. I will be back here eventually. Don't know when my next live will be, but hopefully in a, a couple of weeks or so, we'll be able to do something. Uh, maybe I'll do something from, from bed if needed. I don't know, but we'll get, we'll get there eventually. Uh, appreciate all the kind words. A lot of people have reached out, which means a ton to me. Uh, well, obviously we've got videos coming out the next few days. And like I said, recording videos in advance for next week. So there'll definitely be stuff out there. Uh, subscribe, like, comment, check out those Pack-A-Day podcast YouTube memberships. Enjoy your weekend, everybody. And of course, go Pack-Go.